video. So cool. Um, yeah, so a little bit of my story. By the way, uh, these slides, you can find them at this bit.ly link at the bottom if anybody wants to pull it up um, while I kind of do an intro here. But um, I I started off uh, doing web development, just doing what a lot of people did. I never did the WordPress sites. You were just talking about that a while ago. But I, I started doing a lot of CMS work and got into Drupal pretty quick and did Drupal for a long time. So I was focused mainly on the back end. But um, when I was working for Crown Partners, which is now Razorfish, um, I, uh, I had the opportunity um, to uh, kind of switch, up, switch things up a little bit and focus more on the front end. And, um, and it was something that I wanted to do because I just, I don't know, I guess I like uh, staying on the cutting edge of things. And it seemed like, you know, back end stuff wasn't nearly keeping up the pace as, uh, you know, CSS and JavaScript and all that uh, fun stuff. So, um, which sometimes, you know, I, 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 you know, I wonder if that was a good idea because the pace sometimes seems unreasonable, <laughs> uh, especially with JavaScript. But um, anyway, so I got the opportunity about five years ago to kind of make that switch and uh, kind of took a lead role over at Crown Partners when it, comes, when it came to front end, uh, building front end systems. And uh, so uh, over the last five years, I spent a lot of time thinking about CSS and specifically for larger projects. Um, and so that's, uh, that's what I wanted to talk about today. Um, so why CSS architecture? Um, you know, might ask the question, and I asked this question, you know, years ago, well, why can't we just style our pages and be done with it? Um, why did we have to get all complicated? Um, and, you know, for building sites that are simple and there's not much to it, then CSS architecture really isn't that big of a deal. Um, if you've got a five-page brochure site that you just need to build and, and then you're done with it, um, then, you know, maybe some of these things aren't, aren't stuff that you need to think about. Um, but um, more and more, as we're uh, building websites, we're not building pages anymore. Um, back when I first got started, we were building pages. And... Um, and now, especially with all the devices that we need to, and responsive web design, um, this quote from Stephen Hay, we're not designing pages anymore, we're designing systems of components. So as we, um, as we have deliverables, deliverables for our clients, we're not just sending them pages, um, but we're sending them uh, uh, components uh, of things. And when, when our projects increase in complexity, um, that requires planning and organization and making sure that um, we're putting our project on the right foot. Uh, there are scalability issues, and even for small sites, um, that we need to kind of be concerned about. Um, scalability issues that uh, involve the, just the number of pages or templates that we're building. Um, I've worked on projects where I've gotten... Um, PSD files for 25 different templates. Um, and not only those 25 different templates, they actually gave you PSDs for the, uh, the, the large screen version, the tablet version, and the mobile phone version, um, which uh, didn't work all that well. Um, but, but anyway, um, when you have that many pages and you're building components for all those pages and they need to be able to work together, um, there are scalability problems um, and making sure that uh, you don't have conflicts with your code. CSS is notorious for, because of inheritance uh, and a cascade, uh, you know, you change one thing on one page and you end up breaking maybe three others. Um, and then scaling complexity, especially with uh, responsive design, uh, things have become more complex. Uh, we need to build widgets and components that we'll, we'll be able to uh, put on a small phone or on a large screen, even a large TV like this. And, um, and that makes our, makes our projects more complex. Uh, and then the other thing is scaling our, our teams. So when you work on a project, when it's just yourself, um, there's a lot of things that you can skip that you don't have to do, whereas when you're on teams, uh, you have to be a lot more careful about how you're building things 
um, because as soon as you add one person to the project, um, if you haven't been careful about how you've uh, built and structured your code um, and written it, uh, it's going to be a it's going to be really difficult for somebody to be able to onboard onto that project really quickly, um, and especially when you have deadlines. And I've been in a situ I've been in situations where we have uh, a two-week deadline, and there's just no way one person can get the job done, and you have to add another person to the team. And if it's going to take a week for them to get ramped up, you're in you're in big doo doo. So, what's that? Right. Um, so we're delivering systems to our clients instead of pages uh, a lot of times. Um, and uh, one of the, a quote here from Dave Rupert is, um, with a lot of our de deliverables these days, we're delivering these tiny little bootstrap. Sometimes they're not tiny. Sometimes they're big uh, bootstraps for every client. Does everybody know what bootstrap is? Some of you may not if you're new to web development. Bootstrap is a, is a framework of styling uh, a CSS framework that um, allows you to create some HTML and apply the right classes and get some uh, get things that look really nice, whether it's a carousel or uh, buttons or form elements. And as long as you write your HTML the right way, you'll get something really pretty uh, with the with the Bootstrap um, CSS uh, applied to your page. Um, some you know a lot of people give Bootstrap you know a hard time because so many people so many people abuse it. You know they just throw it on their website, and now all the websites look the same. They all look like Bootstrap. Um, but Bootstrap has uh, been really great as far as um, uh, showing us how to build these design systems uh, in ways that, that people can, can use easily. So we need to start thinking as we're building pages in terms of modules and components, not just pages. And so when we look at a design, um, we, need to, we need to look at things um, from a componentized view and how those are going to work within the page. And a lot of times our components aren't just going to live in one place. Uh, you might have a component and we need to build them this way so that they'll be able to live anywhere on the page. I just uh, highlighted a few with boxes. We have a search component up there. That green thing at the top is some kind of, uh, I don't know if it's an alert or a, a, a global message component. Uh, we've got some, some article uh, teasers. Um, uh, kind of a big one or a lead one, and then some uh, follow-up ones. Uh, I outlined a tab down there. So those are all components that we need to build. And um, one of the best ways to approach this is to build these in silo by themselves. And so there are uh, several tools uh, that we can use to, um, to build out our systems uh, that will make it easier for us, one, to to work with these components and modules that are building, that we're building, but also to um, uh, to show them to our clients. Uh, one of my favorite uh, these days is called Fabricator, and um, it's a. Uh, in fact, actually, let me let's see if I can pull it up. if there's a demo. So Fabricator uh, gives you kind of a, uh, an organized system to be able to, to show uh, components in your, um, in your pattern library. Um, you see over here, uh, we have a bunch of components, uh, buttons, checkboxes, lists, uh, paragraph items, radios, and um, you, know, you get into things like carousels and um, headlines and uh, promotions and things like that. Um, and then you have, take those components and sometimes you put components together and you build even bigger components, or in this, in this case they call them uh, structures. And then ultimately we do want to build pages, um, and so, but typically when we're building pages, a page is just putting a bunch of components uh, together. So that's Fabricator, uh, a great tool, kind of, it's, no, it's based on Node. If you're familiar with that, and it gets you up and running uh, pretty quick. Uh, another one is Pattern Lab. I've used a few times. Um, and Pattern Lab was, Pattern Lab was developed by um, uh, what is his name now? I'm forgetting it. Brad Frost, and I can't remember the other guy's name. Uh, he actually did the development, but it's uh, it's based on you know some of the speaking that he's done 
and uh, the ideas that he's talked about as far as creating, as he calls it atomic design, uh, creating components at different levels, atoms, molecules, organisms, he calls them, and then putting them together with pages. Uh, but that, I'll, I'll put the demo up here real quick. Um, we'll look at some molecules like a uh, component, an accordion. And so uh, build an accordion component in silo, and then he's got some cool tool, tools here to see how it would look on different screen sizes, large and small. And then he has, even has a cool uh, disco uh, thing. So, <clears throat> uh, Pattern Libraries, uh, excuse me, Pattern Lab, and then Google Material Design is a, is a, is a cool website. I won't go there, but um, it's, uh, it's basically Google showing, you know, putting out in public, which they, uh, which they do a lot with their stuff, um, you know, how they do buttons and how they do all these different UI elements that they use ac across a lot of their products. Uh, I didn't know that. No, I... I So just real quick, where did these ideas come from? So, you know, there's nothing new under the sun. Uh, almost none of this is unique or original to me. But here's some of the kind of big uh, things that have uh, formed, you know, my, my thoughts and ideas around CSS architecture. The first is object-oriented CSS, which was, something, it was a term coined by Nicole Sullivan a long time ago. I mean, I, I want to say seven or eight years ago. And object-oriented CSS is really about the idea of reusability. When we're creating components, um, we want to be able to, and she talks uh, specifically about separating the skin of a component, she calls it, um, and the structure. Uh, so a lot of times you'll find in uh, UI elements in your, on your pages that a lot of your components will have similar structure. They might have different colors and borders and text treatments and those kind of decorative things, but they have a lot of the same structure. Uh, her, the thing that she talked about uh, originally, which um, it comes up a lot, is she calls it the media element. And basically, or the media component or module or something like that, um, it's just a layout where you have you typically an image or a video and then some text, whether it's a headline or a description or something like that. And you see those all over the place. And you can take out the, the, the styles that have to do with the layout of, of something like that and put it into its own separate class uh, so that you're not rewriting that CSS over and over each time you're, you're doing that same thing structurally. Uh, another one is SMAX, which stands for Scalable and Modular Architecture for CSS. I think I got that right. Those are the right words. I'm not sure if I got all the endings right, but scalable and modular architecture for CSS. Jonathan Snook um, came up with this. He put out a website. Almost all the content on there is free, uh, but he also has a book. Um, there's a little bit of paid content, but uh, kind of the bulk of it is, is available right there on the website for free. And Smax was kind of focused on this concept of separation of concerns, where we have different, uh, specifically with our, with our styling, our CSS styling, we have different purposes for our different styles. And we're going to look um, at uh, a lot of uh, the types of styles that he talks about a little bit later on. And then the last part is, the last kind of methodology is, is more is newer. It's within the last six months even, I think. Um, Harry Roberts is a web developer out in the UK, and he's done a lot of large projects. And ITCSS stands for Inverted Triangle <laughs> CSS. And it's really about... Um, ordering our styles and being careful and purposeful about how we order our styles and our style sheets. And um, we'll be looking at, at, at that as well. By the way, these are all, if you're, if you're really into CSS, these are all great, great people to follow on Twitter or their, their websites or blogs or whatever. So uh, this, a lot of this, we're going to look at types of CSS rules. And a lot of this came from... Um, from Jonathan Snook with, in his SMAX course, um, and so we'll we'll look at we'll look at the types of CSS rules. This should encompass pretty much anything. 
that you would have in your style sheet. Um, so first is base classes. Then we have objects. Or I guess not base classes. I'm going to say base styles. Um, objects. We'll have components. We have state classes. We have themes. And then we have utilities. Um, I don't think... Uh, Jonathan had utilities in, in his original list, but everything else, I think, and I think he calls objects layout uh, classes, but um, this is pretty similar to, to what he has in his SMAC uh, book. We're going to look at each one of these um, in greater detail. So what are base styles? Base styles are styles that we apply to just bare elements, and they apply globally. So when you're styling your body class, whether you have you know margin or padding on it, uh, your H1 through H6 uh, elements, your anchors, um, all those types of things, that's these, this is our base styles. Uh, here's just a quick example. We don't have any classes. Uh, the specificity is very low. By the way, if anybody's not familiar with that term, specificity has to do with how specific our rule is for our styling. And the more specific you get in CSS, uh, the higher priority that style will take um, when, when being applied. Um, yes? That's good. Yeah. So uh, for those on video, uh, Ricardo said that uh, another kind of way to explain specificity is how strong a selector is, um, will it be, you know, which, which one will overpower the other uh, when it comes to, when it comes to uh, things that clash, when you have two things trying to style the same thing. Um, so uh, styling our images, things like that at a base level, this is very global. The reach is far. It, it affects everything on our site. Some things to consider when we're, when we're uh, doing our base styling. Um, Use a project like Normalize CSS. Uh, uh, projects like these um, have thought a lot, and there's a lot of people who contributed to them, and they do a lot to try to uh, normalize just a lot of your base styling and make them act the same across uh, all browsers. There are things that are quirky in certain browsers and how they display things, and using uh, a library like this uh, will help make your website uh, look the same across all browsers. Again, these are global defaults, um, so kind of be careful. Don't be too heavy-handed. We don't want to uh, we don't want to make all of our uh, links orange if we don't really want that to be the default color on all of our links. Um, if you just want orange links in the sidebar, um, then you know uh, contain contain those in in somewhere else instead of as a global rule. If you find yourself overwriting base styles all the time, that's probably an indicator that you need to take that out of your base, base styles. Now, this is a place where we set up ty typography for our site, set up box sizing models. Um, and so these are just a couple of examples. Um, but uh, those are some, some examples of, of, of base styles. Um, the next thing we'll look at is objects. And this kind of gets back to what Nicole Sullivan talked about with her um, object-oriented CSS. And objects are uh, CSS classes. Go through my, well, actually, actually go through my slides here. Um, they're reusable CSS classes that are for layout and structure only. So you're not going to have any kind of styling that has to do with colors or typography or um, borders or any other decorative type of things. This is purely floats and, um, uh, and widths and heights and all that kind of thing when it comes to layout and structure. Uh, we need to, as we look at designs, recognize layout and structure patterns. Uh, here's one example, and this kind of goes back to Nicole Sullivan's um, media object uh, example from early on. Uh, we have two, two different components here. Um, that are outlined in orange, and uh, but both of them are similar in their structure. Uh, they both have an image, and then they and then they have some text uh, to the side of it. And uh, if we got this down to a small screen, 
uh, the image might be on top or it might be on bottom. And they, both of these will probably act in a similar way. So um, we can take the, the structure and layout and create some kind of object class that will apply this kind of layout to, to all of these items. We see three of them here on this, in this example. Um, the only difference is uh, one has the image on the left, the other has the image on the right. Um, but it looks like kind of the ratios are pretty similar as far as the size of the image compared to the size of the text. And so we can reuse things here and maybe just have slight variations as far as whether things are on the left or right, how they're ordered. Um, and if we can recognize these types of patterns as we look at our designs, that'll help us create the, these objects that, that we want to reuse. Um, here's an example of a, uh, of a, of a component, uh, calling it promo, where it's basically just a box probably, maybe with an image in it. And uh, we have a bunch of rules on here. There's an opportunity here, though, to separate out some of the structural things in this promotion and uh, put it into a separate class. Uh, we have things that are internal to our component, like padding. Um, and then uh, size, like the height, uh, is part of that component. But there are things that we can take out and uh, that have to do with our max width, our margin, and our overflow that would apply to, uh, to other things. And in this case, the purpose of the styles that we took out was actually to just keep our promotions from getting too wide. Um, and so instead of putting those rules right into our, into our uh, uh, component, we can take them out and put them into an object where in something that we can reuse because you might have a page with four or five different components on the, uh, on the page and you want all of them to be limited to a max width of a certain size. Um, and so instead of applying those three rules to all of those, we can just have one class that we can add and uh, have that same structure uh, applied to all three components. And then this is what it would look like to apply it to, to the actual component in HTML. We just have two classes, the promo, which defines our component, and the um, container wide, which defines the structure, or at least one aspect of the structure that's global and reusable. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I, I've never like thought through like, oh, this is how I should do it. But I think that's what I do. I typically tend to do that. The primary class that defines that element or component is what I usually do first. And if there's anything that adjusts it in some way, those usually come after. So. And that makes it, I, I guess I do that because it makes it a little bit easier to read as you're browsing through a bunch of HTML. Um, if you can look at the first class on an element, it, it, that'll help you see, or, oh, this is a promo. If you just see container wide first, that really doesn't tell you anything about what that is. So, Great question. Um, yeah, and so uh, a lot of times you can combine, right, the, an object with, with a... Uh, with a, uh, with, with a component. And sometimes, though, you want to divide them up. So in some cases, you might want to actually uh, have the container wide as a wrapper around your promo. And so you'd have two elements. Um, kind of depends on... Sometimes you actually might actually have uh, styles in your object that might clash with your component, and you'd want to do that. So some examples of objects... Grid systems would apply. That, that's, those are, those are object-type classes. They um, have to do with layout. And then you have layout containers. Um, the, the, the max width, or I can't remember what I called that, container full width or something like that, is just an example of uh, a container around your layout that you want to constrain in some way. Sometimes I've been on projects where I have uh, kind of three different objects for like a narrow constraint, a wider constraint, and then even like a full width, full bleed 
uh, type of thing. And then other structural patterns like the media element that we talked about, or media module, media objects, I guess, that we talked about earlier. So the next, uh, the next piece is the components. And components are going to make up most of your CSS on your project. Um, when, it, when, when you look at all of those, if I, if I go back here, uh, all of these different types of, uh, of styling rules, um, components are probably going to make up like 90%, uh, especially on a larger project. Um, so components are discrete and self-contained pieces of UI. Uh, think things, and I'll probably have examples right after this, think things like buttons, um, carousels, uh, something like a pull quote, which is pretty simple. A button is simple, a pull quote is simple, it's typically just text, maybe with a, an attribution. A header, a header is a, you know, a bigger component, there's a lot to it. Um, and then navigation, and in this case we have an example where typically a navigation would be in your header, right? And so a lot of times your components will contain other components. Um, and again, you know, I already said this, the components make up the bulk uh, of our CSS rules. It's important that our components be independent and self-contained. Uh, one of the most difficult things, and you'll bang your head um, so much when you're working on a project, the, the larger it grows, um, if your components are affecting each other, if your rules for creating you, these discrete elements or widgets on your pages um, are affecting other things, if those styles are leaking out to affect multiple components, um, you're going you're gonna to have all kinds of, of issues. You're going to try to make one change to one component, and you, you're good to go, and then you push it to production, and then you find out, oh, I just broke three others. Um, so it's important. Um, to be able to, uh, to write them in a way that we don't have that, those kinds of leaks. Um, another thing, I guess, related to this is we should be able to take a component and drop it anywhere on our page, and it will maintain its, stru its structure and its design. Um, so when we were looking at those pattern libraries before, those are tools that we can use where as we're building a component by itself, we can resize our browser and say, hey, is this going to look good no matter how wide it gets? Some components you have um, that they take up the full width of the screen. And you might want to take that same thing on another page and actually stick it into a sidebar. And we need to make sure that those components are going to work just as well um, no matter where they are on the page. Uh, components, the, the examples that we gave, buttons, carousels, um, things like that. So components can be small, like a button. This is a component. Uh, it's, there's not much to it. It's just uh, one class, uh, just a little bit of HTML, but this represents um, a component. And components can be big. Something like this. This is an example of a footer. Um, you'll notice in here that we have um, uh, not only we have a component, but inside of our component we actually have an object. We actually have other, another component. Um, in this case, uh, we are, our component is made up of three pieces. We have our kind of our base part of it, and then we have a few other elements, a logo, and then a credit. Um, the, actually, in this case, uh, I would actually probably add um, a, another part of our component would be uh, C footer underscore underscore um, links or social or something like that, uh, really that, that C social uh, component shouldn't be just sitting by itself. Uh, we should kind of have a container for it that's part of our footer itself. All right, so naming components. Um, uh, when it comes to components, components are multiple pieces, at least some of them are. The, the button example just has a base piece, and there's nothing else to it. Our footer had three and should have had four different kind of uh, uh, parts to it. Um, the best way that I've found to name components is with a methodology called BEM. And BEM was a, um, a naming structure um, developed by a Russian... The Russian who's the, who's the, the big uh, search engine? What is it, Yandex? 
the, it's the, the big search engine in, uh, in Russia. And um, so they, they developed this um, just recently. I just get them. I think it's fairly recent, or at least maybe I haven't uh, checked it out in a while. Um, but uh, they used to have a documentation site that was horrible. Um, this get them.com is a lot better. But them just stands for base element modifier. And uh, the, the, the way you use this is actually very simple. Um, when we're building out a component, uh, we have three parts to it, and the first one is required, and the second two parts are, are optional. Um, but the first part is our base, so typically the component name, whatever our base name is going to be. And then if we have sub parts to our component, um, that's the element part. So back, if you look at our footer, we had the logo inside of our footer, um, and then we had, uh, what do we call it, a caption or a credit. And then uh, modifier is the last part, and I should have had an example here. Sometimes you'll have just a base and a modifier. You won't have all three. You'll always have the base, but you'll have either all three or uh, just base and modifier or just base and element. A modifier is a way to create variants of your components, variants um, based on uh, structure or um, color sometimes, maybe typically not color. Uh, We'll look at theme classes a little bit later, and uh, that might be, a, uh, I guess, color. Um, so here's an example. We have an alert, something that we want to show to people at the top of our page, a warning. Uh, in this case, and so uh, we have our base class, so the base part of uh, this component is just alert. Um, and it's highlighted here in all of our classes. So all of our classes... Uh, that are part of this have alert as part of the uh, as part of the name, and then um, our elements are a title, an icon, and a description, and so those are our three pieces. Uh, notice that even though we're kind of embedding into our um, into our component at a few different levels, we're not doing that with our name. So I've seen sometimes people use them, and they'll do like with the icon, for example, to do alert underscore underscore i. Uh, Excuse me. Yeah, for, for the icon, alert underscore underscore title underscore underscore icon. And that's not necessary. You should really never have more than two, uh, you know, the, the double underscores and that's it. Um, sometimes you might, if you want to be more specific, for example, if you have multiple icons, let's say, you might do something like alert underscore underscore title dash icon. Um, and so I, I actually didn't include this, but... If you, if you need kind of a longer, more descriptive word as part of your base or your element or even your modifier, just uh, separating those by single dashes um, is how you would do that. And then, um, and then this is an example of a modifier. So you might have multiple types of alerts. You might have an alert that's more of a status, uh, informational, and so you would do alert dash dash um, info or something like that. And so, uh, in this case, a warning, you might apply a little bit of a different style, maybe a red color, a background, or something like that. If it was an info, you might have a blue background, um, uh, something like that. So, you can also have uh, modifiers on your elements. If you need to change just a single element that's part of your component, um, I find I'm, I don't do that that much. But I have seen it a few times. So why? why? Why would we use this naming convention? What's, why is it useful? Um, one, it's readable. Uh, it's, it's really easy to identify components when you're writing your CSS like this. You can see the base name, and since you see the base name in every part of your component, you can immediately tell which elements are part of that base component. Um, and it's self-descriptive, so what I just said, I guess, is it's describing in the name itself who the parent is. So this element, its parent is this base, alert. <clears throat> and then the last part, and this is, this is really, really, I think, the primary reason why Yandex developed this and why it's powerful is because of specificity. When you get into uh, components where you have um, a, a base class, uh, let's say in, if I go back here, let's say instead of uh, alert underscore underscore title. We just had alert at the top as the parent, and then just on the H1 class, we just had t 
title and that was it. And we could create a rule out of that, right? We just do uh, dot alert space dot title and we can style it. One of the problems that we get into when we do that is specificity. Uh, we just um, made our rule more specific and, like Ricardo said, stronger, and it's going to beat out other things. And one of the biggest problems with CSS is having these wrestling matches with specificity where you have a style that you're trying to override for some reason, and because even though it's later on in your style sheet, um, because your previous style or rule was more specific, um, it's not going to let you override it as easy as easy unless you add an, you know make yours more specific, which a lot of times you don't want to do. Yeah. Right. Right. So uh, I'll just repeat that. So yeah, when you're working with teams, getting a mental model of, of how things are working and how specific things are, um, it's a lot easier when you don't have those struggles. Um, and then what was the other thing? The yeah, the important. If you if you find your project has important all over the place. You're doing something wrong. Um, important should be used very sparingly. Um, all right. I'm okay, so this is just an example of specificity problems. So um, in this case, um, I guess this is just what we talked about. We have an alert component, but we just have the base uh, class name. And we could, right, just style, like we see down there, we could style that H1, that's our title, we don't even have to give it a class. We can just say, hey, if there's an H1 inside of our alert component, we can just style it and we can create these rules. Um, but we see, you know, we, we've, we've created more specificity than, than we want. Um, and so if we want to, for example, add um, an object component or an object class to that or some kind of utility class, which we'll look at in a second, um, those are specific to just one uh, you know, the, the specificity, is, specificity is low, and so it's not going to override stuff that we want to override. Uh, the next thing that we want to look at is state classes that have to do with state of things. State classes are kind of helpers that we add to, to objects or anywhere in our CSS that modifies the state of the component. Well, what is the state? What does that mean? Uh, a menu is an example. Here's the navigation, just three different elements to our navigation. But we want to be able to and indicate to the user which page they're on. Or maybe if we're deeper into the hierarchy, we want to show them what section uh, they're on. And so adding a state is just a class that we can use, like a helper, to, uh, to style how we want that to look visually different uh, based on the state. Typically, um, you don't have, like, uh, you wouldn't have is active and then is not active. It's either there or it's not. So if it's not active, and it's just empty. There's no, there's no class there. Uh, and this is how we might style it. So we have a nav item, and we're just going to say, hey, if that nav item has an is active element on there, we want to make it bold to indicate to the user that that's the page it's on. Um, it's really common to, to uh, add state to things with JavaScript. And it's actually a lot easier. Um, a lot of times uh, I'll see people using JavaScript to change the CSS directly. And man, that can get messy. Um, let's, you know, it's, it's a lot easier if we keep our styling with our CSS. And so if we can use JavaScript to do things just like apply classes, like state classes, and let the classes themselves change the styling to represent what we want, the change that we want them to see, uh, that's going to be a lot better. You can, now with CSS, right, you can apply transitions and animations just by changing the class. And you just write those transition rules you know, into your, um, into your state class and use JavaScript. All you're going to do is remove or add a class and you get what, you, what you're looking for. State classes pretty much always begin with is or has. Um, just some more examples. Is active, is hidden, is selected, <coughs> has focus. 
Um, so just a few examples, uh, but typically it's going to start with is or has. Yeah. The term hidden? Okay. SEO, SEO pros say don't use hidden, the class name hidden in your market. Yeah, it's not true, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so using the, the class name hidden, um, there's, there's, no, there's not going to be any problems with that regarding your SEO. Uh, the next thing we'll look at is themes. Themes are something that aren't on every project. It's not on a lot of projects, um, but uh, they are useful in certain cases. The theme classes, they alter components with unique style, with unique colors or fonts or other types of decoration. And it's just a way to, to, to apply <coughs> a class to a component and make it look different. You know, you know, we're familiar with the concept of a theme, and uh, sometimes we want things that are light or dark uh, based on, I think sometimes, and we we had a project here at Sparkbox uh, a year or so ago where we actually were building, actually the project we're working on now as well, a company with various different brands, and they wanted the same website, and they just wanted to be able to apply a theme to it and just to have a, some different typography, some different colors, and that's it. Um, here's an example of just theming a single component. A uh, pull quote, for example. Um, so it's, it's really basic, but we have this T-light, and that's going to uh, style things a little bit differently than if we put T-dark. Uh, so we have our styles for our component. We're just looking at size and style. When it comes to the colors, we're going to let our themes drive those. So if it's a light theme, we're going to have a light background and a dark foreground color. And if it's a dark theme, uh, a dark with a magenta background and uh, a light foreground. Oh, yeah. Um... Why do, uh, sorry, yeah, let me repeat the question. He's asking, why do I uh, capitalize the color names? Just because I think it looks nicer. Um, yeah, you don't have to. Right. Yeah, no. And I don't typically. <laughs> Is it? That's funny. Um, I mean, I typically don't use color names, just be, usually only in demonstrations. But um, I'm not, I didn't even test these. I don't even know if these will work. So. Yeah, typically I don't. I guess I just do it for names. Uh, utilities. So, so the last type or category for our CSS styles are utilities. Utility classes, they're single purpose helpers that typically apply just one very specific styling rule. <coughs> Some examples of utility classes. Um, we have SP, which stands for space, um, and all that's going to do is it's going to add a margin to, a, to the bottom of our element uh, of 1M. Um, we have a clear fix which if we apply that to an element, it's going to make sure that, you know, if we have floats on our, somewhere in, inside of our component, that all of that stuff will be cleared and we won't have any overlapping uh, of, of content that's underneath. <coughs> I, just, by the way, I, I, I put a few rules on the same line just so it would fit. <coughs> so that's why it's like that on that second line. <coughs> and then um, text center. So all it's going to do is just going to center line the text, and that's it. So these are things, text larger, it's just going to make the the text a little bit larger. These are utilities that just have a single purpose. They only do one thing. Uh, if, you, if, if you're going to have a utility that does more than one thing, like the clear fix, those are more rare. Uh, but it's, 
it does have one purpose, even though it might have multiple rules. Do um, you have a question, Sarah? That's a good. That's a great question. Um, I got to think about that for a second. Um, I think if typically what I do is if if the modify like if I need to make a modification, a modifier or a variant of a component that is fairly that that has a large sweep to it, I guess uh, that's that's changing a lot of things. Like, I don't want to add three or four different utility classes just to modify a component when you can just add one variant or a modifier to your component and change a bunch of different things. Um, right. Yeah, and utilities are meant to be, like, strong. You know, you want them to make sure that they are kind of the final authority on, on styling things. Um, but yeah, I, it's, I, I think if you, for example, I, if you have a, a certain component that maybe has a heading or title to it, and in this one specific case, you want the text to be centered instead of left aligned, um, like I don't know if I would create a, a, a modifier of my component just for that. Uh, I, I would probably just use utility class. Yeah, yeah. Right, that's true. Um, yeah, that's a great question. So in the, here's just an example of how you might use it. So we have three different promos, and we want them when they're stacked to just have some space in between them. We don't want them to be right adjacent to each other. Um, and so for the first two, we're just going to put some, some spacing on them. And uh, this is useful, especially when, when, you, when you build a system for a client, and then a lot of times we'll take a system, a pattern library, we'll hand it to them, and they have to actually build it in their CMS or their enterprise system or whatever. And um, they're taking these components from our pattern library, but you know, there's still things that need to be tweaked and adjusted. And having utilities that, that people can use who maybe aren't CSS people, they're not CSS developers, it can be really helpful. Um, so yeah, uh, utility classes can tweak your layout or they can slightly modify a component without having to create another variant um, or a modified component. But don't overdo it, okay? So um, this is an example of like going way overboard. Um, so you can see here that you can, you can actually take uh, a bunch of utility classes, and you can build something awesome um, that has borders and all this kind of stuff. Um, but and there's there's actually a uh, there's actually a concept called atomic CSS. And it's become popular with some people. Um, I'm not a fan. Um, atomic CSS is basically the idea of you you have a library that you build, and all it is is all these utility classes, these single purpose classes, and you just you know, you, you have the library, and then you just start building elements just by adding 5, 10, 15 different classes to your pages. One of the reasons that you should be careful with overdoing with utility classes is um, there are things that you're adding to the HTML, and if you want to override them or change them, you actually have to change your HTML. So I'm, I've been in situations where I'm in a big Java project, and I have no control over the, the HTML. And so I have to uh, basically send some example HTML over to a Java developer, and they have to um, uh, put it into their, their system. And if I need to make a change to a component, um, it'd be really easy for me just to go into my CSS file that I own and make that quick change. But if there's a utility class, or utility classes all over the place, and i got to go back to that, developer and say, hey, could you remove this or change this or whatever from the HTML? So that's just a consideration, you know, based on your teams and, you know, who's involved. Sometimes that's not an issue. <clears throat> just. 
Yeah, I've been on projects like that where somebody says, hey, we're not able to touch our HTML for whatever reason. It's just too hard. But we can apply new JavaScript and see if they do it. And so, um, anyway, it's just an example. Um, so, yeah, there's the, if you click that universal CSS link, it's like a library. It's a super awesome thing. This is a parody of, uh, of this idea of atomic CSS, which there's a lot of great things in it. In fact, I would actually maybe go and use something from one of these atomic CSS libraries for utility classes. They have a lot of great naming conventions and things like that. Another thing, and I don't know if I have this in my notes. Um, I don't, so I'll go back. Is um, What was I going to say? Well, when it comes to responsive design, so utility classes like typically don't relate to any media queries like screen size. Um, sometimes you can, uh, but typically you wouldn't. I, I don't do that or haven't really. Um, but sometimes you can you can actually use an at symbol. I've seen that in some of these atomic design libraries. You can say, you know, uh, space at small or something. And you can actually have a, a rule that says, hey, you know, on small, on a small screen, then have a, have a, have a space. Otherwise, uh, don't have a space. Um, so. All right, so naming our classes. We talked about BIM, but... Um, we're ta- when I say naming classes, this is not like a pattern, but what are the actual names that we use, like for the base? Um, how do we name things? And naming things is really hard in software and anything. You know, I've, I've got six kids. I've had to name all of them and fought with my wife, and it takes a lot of time. Uh, I can't take as much time when I'm writing code um, to pick out names, but sometimes I want to. Um, there's a, 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 a post on the Sparkbox Foundry, which is our, our, our blog, and um, it's written by uh, one of our developers, Ethan, and it was, it was it's probably the most popular blog article we've had in the last few years. I mean, it just got so many hits um, and because I think it just hits home for so many people. Um, just a few general rules. So uh, typically, most thing, you know, everything is lowercase. Um, and these aren't anything, it's not like anything's going to break if you don't do these, but uh, it's just kind of general conventions that are pretty, pretty standard uh, across the web. Uh, use dashes or underscores. I've seen some people do like camel case and stuff like that, but typically camel case is for like JavaScript and other languages and not CSS. I don't know why. I don't know how it came to be that way, but it just is. And so typically, you know, if you, especially when you're working with teams, you know, typically, you know, you kind of want to, you want to go with the crowd on some of these things. You don't want to, like, be a lone ranger. Um, the, the names should be long enough to discern what they are. So, for example, um, go ahead and write out pull quote. If you do P- PQ, like, people aren't going to understand what that means. So you want people to be able to read that and understand what that is immediately. <coughs> But they don't need to be any longer than necessary. So, uh, BTN is a great short way to, to do uh, a button class. Um, the other nice thing, too, and I, I saw this with, uh, I listened to a podcast by the guy that did the Bootstrap library. He says he specifically used BTN for his button classes because when he does searches in his code, he doesn't get all the button elements um, that come up with those searches. Um, all right, so naming methodologies. And you'll find this talked about even further in that, in that blog post that I linked earlier. Uh, we can name our classes according to the presentation or style. We can name them according to the content that's in them. Or we can name them according to the function. So these are three different ways uh, that we can name, name our classes. <clears throat> and I just want to give examples of each and the pros and cons. So in this case, I took those three different ways of naming and took three different examples of like the same type of component and how they would be named in those different cases. When, when you're talking about presentation, you're naming things by how they look. Um, button green, it's a green button. Uh, rounded image, the image is rounded. Um, large heading, it's, the heading is big. Um, and so... Um, this is, this is great when, you, you know, you're, 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 
um, you're building things and you you want a green button. And you you know sometimes people aren't sure. Well, what is? I just want a green button. A lot of times designers they're going to create buttons maybe that are a few different colors, and um, they have kind of a general idea of their purpose, but it's easy. The, it's the easiest to identify something by how it looks. Um, so this is the easiest thing to do, but it's also the most problematic because uh, think, of a, think of a button. You've got, you work on a project, you've been working on it for two months, you've got 125 buttons all over this website. And then your client comes to you and says, you know what, we just did this, uh, this uh, case study, or no, not a case study, we call it when you like, what is it? Not rebranding when you like get user feedback. I like the Obama campaign. I remember they were like they had like donate button and they tried different colors. Yeah, A/B testing. Yeah, we just A/B tested, um, you know, this button, and we found out that purple is actually gets more clicks than green. And so now you're going to change these buttons, the green buttons, to purple. And the easiest way to do that is just go in and change the style rule, right, from the color from green to purple. You're done. But now you have a bunch of components that are called button green, and they all look purple. And so, um, you know, you don't want that. Um, so uh, when we go down to the second section by content, um, we're naming things by the content that's in them. And this is a, this is a lot safer. Um, but it's a submit button. This is a button for submitting things. Um, a profile image. These are images. They're, right now, we want them to be round. But these are for uh, profiles, when we're showing profiles. And then um, our heading, well, it's, it is large, but it's for our articles. And um, in these cases, um, it's still pretty easy to identify, but you can change how they look. You might have your article title be smaller um, at some point. Or your profile images might change from round to being square. Um, the last one is the safest as far as, like, long-lasting, but it's harder to name, and it's by function. And it's also harder to identify. So <clears throat> um, button primary means, well, this is a button that's going to be for a, some kind of primary action. And well, what does that mean? Uh, you know, that's, that's kind of hard, but it's, you know, sometimes you might want the same type of button. It's a, it has this primary function. But it's for submitting things, it's for uh, call to action, you know, that kind of thing. So, yeah. You're talking about specific specificity with CSS? Hmm. You wouldn't have to. But in this case, like, the, the naming actually so is more general down at the bottom. Like at the bottom, it's these names apply, can apply to more things. Like it can apply to, uh, for example, the content heading. It could apply to articles, but it could also apply to, um, yeah, section headings. And so it's a broader name, which is harder, right? Um, when you have names that describe multiple things, those are harder to come up with those names. Um, so from the top down, it's easier to come up with those names, but it becomes more problematic uh, as you're building things. I go back and forth. Like, I try to never use presentation, even though sometimes I do. Um, I try, so typically what I'll do is when I'm building a component, I'll typically default to, to use the content as the name. And because um, it's just easier to name and it's easier to identify. But if I find later on that I need to refactor, like, oh, I've got an article, but now I have blog posts, which is a little bit different, but there's a ton of similarity. If I'm going to reuse these, these components for articles, um, but now I have to come up with a name that's a little bit more generic. Um, and so you might just call it a post or something like that instead of an article or a, or a, or a blog post or something like that. Um, so. 
namespace thing. This is something I just recently put. You have a question? Yeah. This is for utility classes when you're doing like utility classes that have, okay. So using using the Emmet kind of short names or whatever to, to name your classes, same yeah, following the same patterns. Yeah, I see that they use that a lot in Atomic CSS. Some of the libraries I've seen they, they actually follow Emmet um, shortcuts or whatever. Um, so let me let me try to finish up here real quick. So namespacing this is something I've recently started doing. I found it extremely helpful, and especially on teams. Um, I used this on a project recently, and Harry Roberts, the guy that, uh, I've got an article, of, uh, he's the one that came up with the ITCSS, um, talked about this in one of his blog posts. But just putting a prefix, it adds a little bit more to your name, um, but it's so helpful to be able to identify quickly and easily what type of class this is. An object, you just prefix with O, dot, or o dash, component C dash, state is or has, um, theme T dash and utility is U dash. You've seen this in some of the examples I've given earlier. And when you know what the purpose of a, of a class is, it's just so much easier to work with it, especially when you onboard um, team members. I was working on a, um, actually, Athletes in Action here in town on their site, and I thought, I'm going to do this namespacing uh, of, of all these classes. And um, and then I brought somebody else onto the to the team to uh, to work on the project, and she was just like, was like, wow! I mean, she she really made a big deal. I, I could look at a page, and I could immediately understand what everything was doing. And you you know, with CSS, that's difficult. Um, so I found that this actually is can be extremely helpful, um, especially when working with teams. Uh, so what is this? So here's just an example of, of yeah, of, of that. You can see here, um, I've got an object that's a container, container-wide. It's constraining the width layout-wise of some content within my uh, component. Uh, here, I've got a, two different components, footer and social component. Um, I've got a is active class, which is a state class. And I have a utility class here where I'm centering uh, a label uh, that wouldn't be centered by default, probably, on the, within the component. So... Yeah. Okay, BEM constructor. It's a library? So this is like a, an add-on to staff? Okay, cool. So an add-on to staff called BEM constructor. Right. Yeah. I've had the same because I've I've used SAS as nesting and and with the most recent version of SAS or at least within the last six months. Yeah, you can nest. Uh, I don't know how you how to describe it, but basically you can nest pieces of the name. Um, and so yeah, when you do searches for like the whole name, you're not finding anything. Um, so I went across exactly that. 
Uh, so user preprocessor, I'm, I'm just going to go through this quickly. Um, preprocessors are, are going to allow you to do import, uh, allow you to use variables, which are so useful, functions, mixins, allow you to nest things. One of the nice things about nesting, especially with what I was just talking about, um, it's harder to find things, but if you have a component name, and if you're like me, like as I'm developing a project, I'm constantly refactoring past CSS and changing the names because they don't make sense anymore. And so when you're nesting um, with SAS, you can have your base name at the outer, out, outer level and, and then just do your kind of the rest of your names inside there. And I don't have an example. I wish I did um, for those of you that may not understand what I'm talking about. But in those cases, you can change the base name in one place and you're done instead of um, having to do it in four or five or sometimes 15 or 20 different places. Um, so we want to divide our styles into meaningful files. So when we're organizing our code, um, we want uh, things in logical groups. So we don't want just one big style sheet. Uh, we want to organize stuff so that somebody can browse through just the file system and say, oh, if I want to look, if I want to find stuff that has to do with layout, I'm going to go to the layout file. Um, if Oh, I've got this, this carousel component. Oh, that's where all the styling is for that. Yeah. Yeah. Oops. Partial five, yep. Yes. Thanks for explaining that. So this isn't CSS imports. But I mean, it's the same idea. But this is, in SAS, when you use import, it's actually going to take these files, merge them into a single one, which is what you want. So, but this will define the order that everything gets compiled into. Um, when we're doing variable names, it's a great idea to prefix them. And um, this helps you identify, like, especially with colors, like if you're naming a color like red, and then you want to change that, that later, um, you, you know, again, you have the same problem we talked about earlier. Um, you have a variable name called red, and then you just change it to a different color and it doesn't make any sense. So um, the other thing is ni that's nice is a lot of, or at least I use WebStorm or PHP Storm, and it will autocomplete variable names in SAS. And so I just type dollar sign C, and it gives me a list of all the colors available. And so I don't have to try to remember them. Yeah. What's it called? Pigments for Adam. Okay, that's a pl So the Adam editor has a plugin called Pigments, and it does this, or? Color preview. Okay, cool. Awesome. Yeah, PHP Storm, uh, WebStorm does the same thing. It'll put it in the gutter. I don't know if it does the same thing for that. Cool. Yeah, that's nice. That's that kind of stuff is invaluable. Finding a good IDE, and I, I've heard lots of great things about Adam. Um, we can also scope our variables. So when you're doing, like if you have a, a file for your variables, make sure those are global. Um, it's, it's, it's a lot better to, if we have a variable that's just going to apply to our component, like the color, sometimes our components can be really big. And if we have certain colors that we're using across our component, maybe, and uh, we want to use a variable so that if we have to change it at some point, we don't have to change it in four or five different places, just in one. But if you put your variable names in the first nesting of your component, then it'll stay scoped to that. It won't leak out outside of that. Um, so that's, that's useful. Okay, so this is the last part, source ordering, and this has to do with ITCSS, um, the inverted triangle method. Um, it's a method of ordering your CSS settings and rules to prevent namespace collisions and specificity rustling and leaky styles and then inadvertent regressions. And that's at least what he says. I, it, it's, um, I don't know if it's, it's that, I don't want to say it's not that helpful, but uh, that seems to be, uh, a, a broad reaching brush. I don't know if it can do all those things. Um, but the idea is is that the order from top to bottom, so 
So specificity works, right? Typically, rules lower down are going to override rules higher up, unless you, they're more specific. Um, and so, if we order things in the same way that we kind of generally uh, have higher specificity, then we're going to have less wrestling, because the natural ordering of things is going to uh, is going to follow our specificity. And so, uh, this is his recommendations when we're writing is you know settings for SAS tools like mixins and functions are next. Um, generic things like our base styling, uh, element styling as well, and then we do our objects and then our components, and then trumps are things like utility classes. Um, and so that's the recommended order. Um, he talks about three things. So reach is how broad something is, so a, something that's styling all anchor tags has a far broad reach. We want that high up near the top. Um, specificity, as we are at the top of our style sheet, our specificity should be very low. We should only have maybe one element. Uh, first, we're just styling elements, and then we're styling individual classes. Only at the very bottom should we be, you know, doing multiple selectors or uh, important. <clears throat> and then explicitness, specificity, uh, so explicitness has to do with, uh, you know, just how focused we're getting when we're styling something. Do we want to style all anchor tags? Do we want to style just this one anchor element? inside of this one component. That's being more explicit. And so this is an example of a fast file where we're importing, combining all of our stuff, and ordering them in the right way. We have kind of a namespace here where we're pre prefixing all of our file names with those layers that, that he talked about in that one triangle graph. So we have our settings, we have our tools, our generic stuff, our elements, our objects, our components, and our trumps. And so I found this helpful to, to you know, when, when just organizing, sometimes you just don't know how to order things. Like, you know, typically there's things that, oh, yeah, I definitely need to put my variables at the top. Otherwise, I'm not going to have access to them. Um, but um, anyway, that is all. Just a few minutes over. But um, any questions or other thoughts, comments? Taylor? No, I haven't. Enduring CSS, what is that? Okay. Right. So invest the time early on. And enduring CSS provides some kind of framework, or is it just a just a strategy? Enduring CSS. I'll have to look that up. Grant? So, what we're talking about is a lot of libraries and a lot of things can happen in two years and years of thought process. One, can you speak to anything about managing those? And two, when you run into some namespace issues when you run into things you've used in the past and you can run into that issue. Okay, so the question is, um, when you're working on multiple projects, can you find yourself creating similar components? And um, you know, how you know, is there something I do to uh, kind of have a, a general use library that I can kind of pull in? Is probably your question. We've had that idea at Sparkbox. Um, I think we have like two components in there. It's not really not really taken off. It's, it's a time investment, and typically what we find is. You know, we go back to that old project that we remember. We still have the code for it, and we pull it out. So that's typically what happens. What was the other question? Oh, are there any namespace issues? Namespace issues? Oh, I don't really. If you're doing a good job of kind of keeping things um, encapsulated, your components, then typically you're not going to you know, have those issues. Yeah. Anybody else? Alphabetizing, like in your within your rules, um, that's a. I've tried to do that and just gave kind of gave up. I don't find it as. So the question is, you know, is, what's the value of alpha, alphabetizing your rules within your uh, selectors, right? Um, you know, that can be, especially if you have a lot of rules, that can be helpful. 
Um, what I typically do is put like layout and structure stuff first, and then decorative stuff later. Alphabetizing stuff in performances? I've never heard that. Taylor, go ahead. Zipping, well. But then it turns out sorting them by um, frequency, that doesn't like that show. So you actually don't want out. So don't alphabetize if you're looking for performance. That seems like something that the code process would Oh, yeah, absolutely. But like, the important part was when you do stuff like layout stuff first, you kind of like already are sorting by like frequency or Yeah. Well, I was just wondering about documentation. Like, do a document project with all this stuff? It's hard because when you have teams, I mean, like I'm on a project right now. It's been a year long project. It's kind of where the client's kind of not in a hurry. <clears throat> and as you know, there's been five different developers on it. And it's a little bit messy. Um, and if we would have had documentation, it probably would have gone a little bit better. Um, I try, I put documentation, like the namespacing stuff, the list, the types of classes, I put those in a readme on my project because I want anybody else on the project to know that this is how this project is going. And sometimes people don't do it. And if I can point back and say, read the readme. Um, you know, that's actually on my to-do list uh, to do a boilerplate readme. I mean, it's more than just this stuff, but um, I have bits and pieces in different readings. <laughs> so, but uh, I'll, I'll maybe share it um, when we get to that. Anything else? Yeah. KSS node, okay. The node module or something? Or? Okay. Oh, yeah, 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 I've seen this. So it's like a fabricator or a pattern lab, except it's the primary document is the CSS, and you actually put all your documentation and comments in your CSS. Cool. Yeah, I think we checked that out for one of our clients. They were looking at for tools. And fabricator actually has HTML, or actually handlebars files, and you write the HTML, and you actually put the documentation in the HTML file. So kind of... But doing the CSS, pretty cool. Anything else? I know we're kind of over time. But did anybody learn anything new? I know, um, you know, I got one, somebody messaged me and said, you know, I, I'm pretty new to CSS. And, uh, you know, I'm hoping there's stuff in here for everybody at any kind of level to, to learn, whether you're brand new to CSS or you've been doing it for a long time. So. Can you give a quick rundown as far as Nathan uh, build? Oh, build? So you start off with getting fast running uh, gulp in the... I've used grunt gulp, just NPM by itself. Um, it, I always do it different. So, and a lot of times I'm not the one starting a project, so whoever, whoever the one, you know, that, that started it. But, you know, I, if, especially if you've never used um, a build system, you can go find one that you know you just kind of download and it's already set up for you with SAS and all these other things. We have a project right now at Sparkbox where we're going to be using Bootstrap, and it's because the client wanted to. Yeah. And um, at times, like we pulled pieces out of other libraries. There's one called Pure CSS by Yahoo. We've used their grid system. Um, foundation has things. So typically we don't use like the whole thing, but you'll find pieces like I've used Pure also has a, a great forms foundation where it basically makes, uh, provides a great uh, start to building out styles for your forms. And I've used that as a starting point. So. 
What's it called? Inuit. So Harry Roberts created Inuit CSS, and what is it? Okay. Like utility classes or objects? Okay. So it's a library that you can pull from of objects and things. That's cool. I'll have to look that. Look at that. By the way, if you want free stuff, pull this up on your computer or your phone. Um, so go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. There's so many things you can do. Um, yeah, post CSS, I love. Um, I, there's one called Backpack or Pack Rat or Rucksack. That's it. And it's got some really cool, really cool stuff in there. Um, that yeah, auto prefixer, just post CSS. <coughs> Okay, live stats. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's a, it's a GUI for stats and stuff like that, yeah. While you're talking, I'm going to pick a winner. So everybody, um, yeah. All right. Any green, green phones or computers back there? Is that, is that Tom? Cool. We're going to do this again, so don't put your phone away. Two months of plural site. Two months of plural site. All right. Going to go again. 22 people. Anybody else? 23, 24, 25, 26, going once, 27. All right. And... Anybody? All right, Matt. Yeah. What are you doing, Matt? Okay, cool. Do we want to? Hey, are we doing three? Three? Okay, one more time, guys. Um, yeah, sorry for going over. I, I, this is the first time I've done this presentation and I didn't know how long it was going to go. All right. All right. Thanks. Hey! Anybody? Are we in that corner still? All right. <laughs>